washed his face with a frying pan, combed his hair with a broken chair, and died with a toothache in his ear. Going up. Hey, good morning there, Chloe. Oh, you look kind of beat. Yeah, my little sister had a really bad fever last night, and we were up with her almost all night. Ooh, that's tough. Can you imagine doctors not only used to come to your house when you were sick, but nurse you through a bad night? Wow. Yeah, Doc Forrest was a legend in our town. On every block, there was some family whose little boy's finger he saved, or maybe he doctored someone's daughter through a fever or delivered a difficult baby. But I don't think there was a family in Woodstock that owed more to Doc Forrest than the Stroms. As I mentioned probably before, my brother Bob got sick when he was 11. Real sick. It was a disease that made his kidneys go bad, and one time he was out of school in bed for six whole months. Bob never, ever complained, though. No, he, he did his share of complaining about other stuff, but not about being sick. He truly felt that every day he was alive was a gift, and he made the most of it. That's because Bob didn't almost die just once. He did it four different times. And each time it was Doc Forrest who pulled him through. Those were the real bad ones, but there were scores of others, and he was there for those too. See, when I was growing up, doctors showed up at your house if you were real sick. There's something about fevers that bring them out at night, so Mom would call Doc Forrest at 2 a.m., and his old Cadillac would magically appear five minutes later. I used to marvel at the massive car trunk stuffed to the brim with bandages and medicines and shot givers. He even had a whole box of popsicle sticks to make you say, ah, with. The good doc in his long woolen coat would walk in briskly, smelling of clove chewing gum and carrying a big black medicine bag. First he would get the lowdown from mom in the other room, then he would kneel down at Bob's bedside and start talking to him as if they had bumped into each other on the square. Hey, Bobby, it's Doc Forrest. How you doing there, pal? All the while, he'd be rummaging through the medicine bag for stethoscopes or thermometers. Two things took me a while to figure out. Why he always introduced himself to Bob and why he asked all those silly questions. Bobby, what month comes after February? Are the White Sox in the National League or American? My little sister always fought her way to the bedside if she was awake, just so she could be the first one to answer the questions. But I don't think that was the point. Doctor would feel Bob's forehead. He might give Bob some pills or maybe a shot. When it could go either way, he would stay at Bob's bedside for two or three hours, holding his hand, telling him over and over he was going to be okay. It was as if he were the Wizard of Oz, getting Dorothy to believe she was back in Kansas. One time when Doc Forrest was out of town, Bob was taken to the hospital and the other doctors were going to do something that would make Bob stay hooked up to machines forever. After driving all night, Doc Forrest rushed into the operating room the next morning at dawn, yelling and throwing stuff, saying he would never work at that hospital again if they did that procedure. So they backed down, and four days later, Bob walked out of the hospital all on his own. Not that he was exactly cured. The, the thing about this disease is that there is no cure. The best you can do is keep the patient alive. Doc Forrest knew they were messing around with transplanting stuff from one person's body into another. They weren't doing it with kidneys yet but he knew he just had to keep Bob alive a few more years and Bob could get a kidney from someone else and be just like new. So yeah, Doc Forrest was pretty important to us, his family too. His wife, Sis, would come over and drink coffee with Mom in our living room. Their son, Denny, had a wooden leg. Sheila was the prettiest girl who ever lived and Bob kept her picture up on the wall. Tim was just a regular nice kid. One day when I was 10, mom's eyes were all red when I got home from school. 
I was afraid it was on account of Bob, and I ran up two flights of stairs to the room we shared together. But there he was, in a white t-shirt with his sleeves rolled all the way up, calmly putting together a model of a 1960 Impala while listening to 45s. What's wrong with Mom, I asked. Doc Forrest hit someone with his car, he said quietly. Bob didn't look up when he said it, and I could tell this was some serious business. After a whole lot of tinkering with that little car and a whole lot of me just being still, he said Doc Forrest had run over a little boy who had darted out in the street to get a ball. It happened on Hoy Street in front of the Sullivans, and the boy was dead. Immediately, I knew the place. It was on the way to Riley's, and at a certain time of the day, when you were pedaling back over the little rise, the sun ambushed you for a good second or two, and you couldn't see a thing. The ball goes out there ten seconds later. Maybe Doc Forrest stops to fiddle with his keys for a second, or, or maybe he and the little boy pick a time of day when the sun isn't filtering through that elm tree. And that goes into the books as just another beautifully boring autumn day in Woodstock, Illinois. Instead, all those things line up like the crosshairs on the muzzle of a gun. And the world turns dark and worrisome. School was canceled that morning so kids could go to the funeral with their families. The church was packed. Doc Forrest sat way in the back in the corner all by himself. I was singing upstairs with the choir and couldn't take my eyes off him. He looked straight ahead the whole time. But life has a way of getting back on its feet, going on. That afternoon, kids were back in class, razzing Tom Newmeyer, puzzling over fractions. A couple days later, I was up in my room reading Tarzan when the phone rang. Bob being sick and all, we had an extension up in our room. He would always pick up the phone and listen in on whoever was talking. Until whoever was talking would say, Bob, is that you on the extension? But today, that didn't happen. And he hung up quietly. That was Sis Forrest. She wanted to know if Doc had stopped over here. The hospital called her to ask where he was, and she didn't know. He hasn't gotten back in a car since the accident. He's out walking. Doc Forrest is lost. Bob said this in a way I can't quite describe. He said it as if he were describing a Boy Scout who had wandered too far away from a camp out. He said it as if he were talking about a grown-up man who didn't know what to do next. He said it like a 16-year-old kid who was tethered to life by a kite string that was about to snap. Without another word, I galloped downstairs. I yelled back over my shoulder to Mom. I was going to ride down to Riley's and hopped on my bike. There are two ways down to Riley's, down Lincoln and Daisy and straight down Hoy. I went down Lincoln and Daisy first, keeping my eyes peeled for tall, grown men with mustaches. When I got to Riley's, I drove through the parking lot to say I'd been there and came back the other way, past Doc Forrest's house and on towards home. And then it happened. As I was zipping down the little rise, the sun momentarily blinded me and I felt my tire run over something that felt, you know, maybe like a dead squirrel. When I could see again, I looked back and skidded on the brakes. I had run over one of Doc Forrest's white wingtip shoes. He was sitting there on the curb all by himself. I threw my bike down in the grass and ran back. Doc Forrest, I cried. I'm so sorry. He smiled a very thin smile and shook his head. It's okay, Davy, he mumbled. No harm. No one else ever called me Davy, just like no one but Doc Forrest ever called Bob Bobby. I stood there for a moment awkwardly. Something was wrong. Well, I mean, other than Doc Forrest sitting on a curb on the side of the street. 
No, it was something else. Something about this picture did not add up, and then I realized what it was. Doc Forrest had on just a T-shirt and khakis. In all these years, I had never seen him without a white shirt and bow tie. They're looking for you, you know. I told him this like I was on his side, and he nodded. Mind if I sit down? He shook his head. He was taking hard, short breaths, the kind you take when you're trying your darndest not to cry. I tried to think of something to say, but I didn't have to. Oh, it hurts so bad, Davy. It hurts so bad. I had been staring out at the street. Now I looked up at his face. I wasn't used to seeing Doc Forrest without the impish little smile peeking out from underneath his gray mustache. Even when Bob was really sick, a hint of it was always there. Not now, though. Doc Forrest looked across the road as if he were watching his house burn down. Where does it hurt, Doc Forrest? He pointed to his chest. Right here. Right everywhere. I started to say something, then I stopped and grabbed his hand the way I had seen him grab Bob's hand all those times. I squeezed it, and he squeezed back. Doc Forrest, what's the name of the store on the square where kids sign up every day to win a prize? He finally looked at me, confused. Stones, he answered slowly after a long pause. He said it as if he were reaching back into some place he hadn't been in a while. I nodded. That's right. Why do they call Mr. Peasley high pockets? Again, there was a long pause, and again he struggled through with the right answer. Don, Don, where's his pants too high? Good, I replied, giving his hand another squeeze. What's Louis Aparicio's batting average? This time, Doc Forrest answered like he was Doc Forrest. I don't know that, Davy. I was momentarily disappointed. You're right. That was a tough one. See, Doc Forrest, that's why you have to get better. You have to. You know the questions to ask a person when they're hurting. I had pulled Doc Forrest back from somewhere else. Now I had to get him to stay here. This hurt you have, Doc Forrest? Well, I I don't think it's ever really going to go away. But you can't give in to it. If you do, it'll be like your brain is on a machine, just like Bob's body would have been if you'd have let those doctors do what they were going to do. Doc Forrest, you have to... Get up from this curb and come to my house and let my mom make you some hot chocolate. If you do that, I promise you, you'll feel... Well, you'll feel just the teensiest bit better. Do you like red licorice? His face ricocheted back and forth between a smile and a frown a million times per second. At long last, he nodded. Good then. While you're drinking your hot chocolate with Mom, I'll ride down to Riley's for some red hot dollars and a slow poke, and then you'll feel even a teensy more better. And me and Bob and Karen and Dad and Sis and everyone else will just keep doing that until the herd is buried under 77 blankets of good stuff. Tears were dripping down his face now. But for some reason, that felt like a good thing. Like a warm rain that coaxes spring daffodils to poke their heads out of the recently thawed Illinois soil. Doc nodded his head, then we pulled each other up. I left my bike there and we walked back to my house. Doc Forrest came back from the dead that day, just like Bob had so many times. You see, there are different ways of being dead. There's 
the dead where you stop breathing, and then there's the kind of dead where you breathe and eat and brush your teeth, but you stop noticing how good fresh peaches taste and how funny the little rascals are. You pretend to be alive, but you're really as dead as George Washington. Well, Doc Forrest didn't die like that. I'm guessing he was never perfectly well after the accident. Just like Bob was never perfectly healthy the rest of his life. But eight years later, I gave Bob a kidney that lasted for 16 years. And then Karen gave him one of hers that lasted even longer. And between the two of them, Doc Forrest and Bob did pretty well for themselves. We never really talked about that day after that, Doc Forrest and I. But every once in a while after that, I'd get a letter in the mail asking for a refill on his red-hot dollar prescription. There would always be a one-dollar bill inside and a thank-you note for doctoring him up. Top floor, boomerang.